Hello, I'm Peter Merrick, an obstetrician, gynaecologist in Albury, Widonga. I'm going to talk about Achillean's rotation and delivery. I believe there's still a place for Achillean's delivery for when there's a malrotation of the fetal head. Now, I'll just explain what I mean by the malrotation. The normal delivery occurs because the baby flexes and comes down the birth canal in an OA position. If the baby is occipitolateral or posterior, two things happen. One is the baby deflexes, which makes it a bigger presenting part, and it will not deliver in that position. So the idea of the delivery is to rotate the baby, to put it into the OA position, and to flex the baby. So the manoeuvres I'll be doing vaginally will be doing that. Now the indications for Achillans, as I said, the commonest indication is a malpresentation, either a lateral position or a posterior position. It can be used for the aftercoming head of a breech, which is a rare event these days, and it can be used for a prolapsed cord of a second twin. Again, an uncommon situation. So the most common is a, a lady having a first baby where the baby's posterior, about 30% of them or more will need an operative delivery and assistance. There are other indications such as hypertension, past cerebrovascular accident, cardiac disease, and so on, but these are very rare com compared to the malpresentation. Of course, the baby can also have an indication such as acute fetal distress, but it's uh, more likely that the labour's been obstructed and then the distress. So I'm going to just demonstrate that to you now. Before you start the procedure, the, it's very important that you think about where the delivery is done, and that is should it be done in the labour ward or should it be done in operating theatre because if, if, it, if the baby is not deliverable then you will need to follow on immediately with the caesarean section. The other thing is analgesia. This should not be done with a pretendal block. It's not adequate analgesia. You should have either an epidural or a spinal or occasionally even a general anaesthetic. So that's very important indeed. So I'm going to demonstrate this on the mannequin as I would in real life. I've been consulted for an obstructed labour and the situation now is that I'll examine the baby. I've taken a history. I want to see roughly how big the baby is. I want to see which side of the mother's abdomen the, the back is and I feel the back's over here. More important than that, I must make sure that the head's engaged. There shouldn't be any head palpable above. If there's head palpable above, it's a dangerous delivery and you should be considering to do a Caesar. Now, these are the Keelan's forceps and they're beautifully designed forceps. They have a cephalic curve, which means it goes around the baby's head. There's a pelvic curve, but it's very slight so that you can rotate 360 degrees. You never really have to do that, but 180 degrees. Whereas the Neville Barnes forceps have a large pelvic curve and you can't rotate. They also have a sliding lock, and I'll demonstrate that in a minute. On the handle, there are two little knobs, and we call these the occiput knobs. I now know that the baby's back is on the left, the mother's left. So I put the forceps in the position that they'll be. I'll take the anterior blade, and that's the first blade that I'll be putting on. Now I must emphasize that the lady has proper analgesia, like an epidural or a spinal, and I don't do two finger examinations in full dilatation. I use my whole hand and my thumb. So parting the labia, I have emptied the bladder. If, if there's a catheter in the bladder, I'll often remove it because pulling the baby past a blown up balloon can often cause immaturity. So I do a whole hand examination. And with this, I'll show you what my hand is doing. So my hand is coming up. I don't even try and assess the fontanelles, but I run my hand around till I find an ear. And then I can feel the pinna of the ear, and the pinna points towards the occiput. So I know this is an LOT. 
Sometimes I'll feel a hand, sometimes there'll be a cord around the neck because my fingers are right up at the level of the neck. Now once I've got the ear, I keep my hand there because some babies can move quite a lot in between contractions. I have my blade ready and it's lubricated. I then place the blade with my hand still on the ear and I'm putting the blade onto the ear precisely. Now usually the tissue pressures will hold it in position. Occasionally you'll need an assistant to hold that. So that's the anterior blade. The posterior blade then goes vertical into the sacrum without pressure. It should just fall on and now I've got a grip on the baby. To flex the baby I then track down and rotate gently between contractions. That's absolutely essential. You must not rotate the baby during a contraction but between. And then once I've rotated you can see now that the baby is flexed and presenting with the occiput. Now, as I said before, I use my whole hand to do a vaginal examination. My right hand if the baby's back's on the left, my left hand if it's on the right. I just find that's easier for me. My whole hand, including my thumb. I'm going around the occiput now. I'm going to the ear. My blade's ready. I don't let the baby move. The, the vertical blade, no force. The blade just falls on under its own force. I then take the other blade and it's got to be vertical. It can't be in a horizontal position. It has to be vertical into the sacral promontory. Gently, no force, and it slides in and the blades lock. Now, at this stage, I wait until there's no contraction. And then I try and rotate in that plane. If it goes around easy, fine. If it doesn't, I put a little bit downward traction and rotate. And this is rotating very easily. So between contractions, I must emphasize, you must only rotate between contractions because otherwise the uterus is grabbing the baby's body. Now, I believe that an episiotomy is essential, especially for a prima gravida because you want to avoid a third degree tear. So I have everything ready. I do a midline to 30 degree lateral and cut. Then I stretch and then I cut again. And that way I've dislocated the whole anal sphincter and it, it in my hands it's avoided third degree tears. So once I've got the episiotomy performed, I then wait for the next contraction very important to pull to the floor and mother's pushing, uterus is contracting so I don't have to do all the work. There's the occiput here coming down so I know it's in the right position and sometimes if it's tight I might do a little bit of winkling where I gently rock the baby through. Now I'm looking at the occiput here and a bit of pushing until you'll feel the baby's coming through. Now, once at this stage, you can remove the forcep, deliver the baby's head, and proceed with the normal delivery. So this is the correct position for the keelans over the mandible and over the lateral parietal bone. Now I'm going to demonstrate shoulder dystocia which can happen when you've had a delayed labour and you know it's a male baby, you know it's a big baby but 60% shoulder dystocia has happened out of clear blue sky so we all need to know how to manage them. Now the first thing is you get a warning because the head doesn't deliver quickly. You have the turtle sign where it comes out and goes back and comes out or you've delivered the head and you can't get to the mouth. That's another warning sign. So if you think there's shoulder dystocia, you try without a lot of traction or flexion to pull and it's, you can feel that it's arrested. The reason it's arrested is because the smallest diameter of the pelvis is the AP, anterior posterior, and the baby's shoulders will be stuck here. So the first thing we do is the McRoberts, where we get two assistants, thank you, to lift the head up 60% 
of the babies will deliver with the microbials. You try this for 30 seconds. If that doesn't work, then you get an assistant on the side of the baby's back to press suprapubically. What you're trying to do is press the shoulders away from the midline. If that doesn't work, 30 seconds, I then put my hand in, again left hand for this side with the baby's back on the left, and I try and rotate the shoulder to an oblique position. If that doesn't work, I keep my fingers in, I go the other hand, and therefore I can use a corkscrew. If that doesn't work, I swap fingers around and then go the reverse corkscrew. If that doesn't work, and we're now talking about 5% or so, one of the hardest obstetric procedures is delivering the posterior arm. Now, you have to place your hand in at the posterior level until you find a hand. It's lovely to find a hand, and I found one. And then you swing the arm around the baby's head and deliver the hand. And here comes the hand. And once you've delivered the arm, you've, you then have traction. You don't pull on the arm and then you have completion of delivery. There, there is a final one which I've never seen, and that's pushing the baby back and then doing a Caesar, Zavanelli. I think that would be very traumatic. And there's another procedure that's done in third world, which is symphysiotomy. Now, finally, I'm going to demonstrate a symphysiotomy. Now, this is exceptionally rare in Australia, but it can be essential in a third world country to save the mother and the baby's life, particularly when there's no theatre facilities available. It can be used when there's an obstructed labour, and it can be used, obviously, when there's infection and a live baby. You wouldn't do a symphysiotomy if the baby was dead. The first procedure must be a catheter. So you put a catheter in, and then dislocate the urethra to one side. We then have local anaesthetic, and I've done these without an epidural, just under local, and you make a large blob of local. If you've got an episiotomy, if you've got an epidural, you don't need local anaesthetic. The trick is my fingers behind, and you can feel where the symphysis pubis is. And with a needle, I can run the needle down, and it goes. It's like going through butter, and I can feel that, and I can feel the tip of the needle on the end of my finger. And once I've got that position. I've made a little nick with a scalpel blade and then I use, this would be a very good symphysiotomy blade because it's blunt and you place it into the symphysis with the blade upwards and you get two assistants. Very important that they hold the legs up and do not let go. So the blade goes in and then you divide, divide, it's very simple to divide and then you turn the blade around and divide until you can feel the inferior part of the ligament. You don't go through the entire ligament. At this stage, you can feel there's a small gap, and then you get your assistants to abduct the legs wide open, and the symphysis will open up to five centimetres. Mm. With that, you can often have a normal delivery or a vacuum delivery, occasionally a force of delivery. The benefit is, for their next delivery, they're more likely to have a normal birth. So in conclusion, I've demonstrated a Keelan's faucet tonight and I do believe they're a valuable instrument and I do believe the young specialists should be instructed how to use them. They do take a lot of training and a lot of supervision. It's not something you can pick up very quickly. But once you have the skills of a Keelan's, it doesn't matter what the presentation is, you are able to correct that presentation with the Keelan's forceps.